Hello. Thanks for coming. You're, you're back again. Yes, I am. <laughs> Lovely. We are now recording, so just to just to warn people, um, if if you don't want to be have your face shown or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're not wearing pants, stay seated. <laughs> Best thing to do. All right, so uh, I'll uh, get the screen share going and let's get started. Go ahead, Ian, take it away. You can. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, this, uh, this session is titled Throw Away Your Grammar Syllabus, a very provocative title. Um, so Adam and I are, are presenting today. Adam and myself are from AAS Press, um, a publishing company, uh, which is uh, kind of dedicated to making quite motivational materials and we'll talk a bit about uh, the things we've been making later uh, but first we'll we'll look at this kind of provocative title and hopefully that'll get you thinking about the some some interesting things within our industry so uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Adam now right yes yeah, so I have to admit uh, so the title throw away your grammar syllabus this really was kind of an attempt to uh, turn some heads and get a bit of uh, attention uh, I do like grammar myself and I, I have taught grammar uh, over the years a lot uh, to kids and to adults as well. Uh, but what we're gonna look at are um, some holistic approaches and some other alternatives uh, or ways to complement um, a grammar syllabus uh, that we think uh, really suits younger learners well. Yeah, so more, oof, next slide, there we go. So we'll, yeah, we'll look at holistic approaches and some of the advantages that they might uh, have for teaching younger learners. Uh, and at the end, we'll also look at some of the AAS Press materials um, which are all kind of in a more holistic style. We'll look at the Awesome Adventure series, um, Awesome Phonics Adventures, and if time we might uh, touch on the Gamerized Dictionary again, but we, that's not the main uh, one for this session. Right, so uh, to start it off, we're gonna do a little kind of demonstration. And what I'm going to do is read to you a completely random list of 20 words. Now, uh, if you have a pencil and paper, please do not use it. I repeat, put down your pencil and paper. Uh, you're, you're not supposed to write these things down, okay? Um, you will see where I'm going with this in a bit, so don't worry too much, just bear with me. Uh, let me stop share there for a second. And okay. All right, here goes the words. Table, run, wire. Honest, lake, radish, corner, carpet, zesty, cost, open, quill, tumble, gray, coat hanger, Hi, piano, hard drive, and finally, slash. Okay, so moving along. Um, oh, I'm would... really sorry. Could I interrupt just a second? Sure. Hi. Uh, I'm I'm uh, Louise. I'm um, taken over as an emergency host for this session. Because it was, uh, it was, I was told there was no one here, but I do see there's someone with room five on there. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm here. I came at the beginning and uh, kicked it off. So it's oh, I'm so sorry. Time. Somebody must have given That's me. Okay. Simon told me to come in. I apologise. I will leave again. Um, sorry to interrupt. Goodbye. <laughs> okay. See you. Thank you. Well, Welcome that back, was funny. That was exciting. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that'll help or hurt. But I'm going to move on to the next thing right away, uh, and I'm just going to tell you a story uh, about something that happened to me. All right. So this is a true story, uh, and this happened when I was 14 years old. Now uh, I'm from Canada, and I've always uh, hated team sports. Hockey is incredibly popular in Canada, as I think Suzanne knows, as she might be from Canada as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I was never really interested in team sports. Um, but my best friend Kurt. Uh, was an absolute uh, hockey fanatic. He loved it. Um, and he was talking to me about hockey all the time, but uh, it just didn't interest me. So, but one day I found out that you could actually go to the local convenience stores and you could buy kind of like lottery tickets, uh, which allow you to bet on the hockey games. Uh, and this is something that did interest me quite a lot. Uh, and I got into hockey kind of in that way. 
So one day Kurt uh, comes to me and he says, oh, my dad has season's tickets uh, through his company to the Montreal Canadiens game. Uh, that's the uh, team from my city. And uh, he invited me to go to a hockey game. So I went to my first uh, actual hockey game uh, and we had uh, really good seats. Um, the seats were kind of right behind, I don't know if you know much about hockey, but right behind the penalty box, uh, but just above the glass. So you could see right into all of the action. You could see really close up what was going on. Now, um, during the game, uh, I don't remember this terribly well, but a puck was fumbled off the ice. Somebody hit, hit the puck quite hard. It flew off the ice, flew into the audience, whacked me on the left side of my head, right in the eye. Um, and I wasn't knocked unconscious, but I was dazed. I got kind of uh, confused and I didn't, I couldn't, I can't remember what I saw at that time. I think I had my eye, probably my hands over my eyes and I felt a little confused. What I do remember is that the puck had kind of bounced off my head and gone to the row behind. And a man in the row behind us uh, grabbed the puck. And I just remember my friend Kurt um, arguing with this man saying, come on, he got hit in the head. Give him the puck, give him the puck. But uh, yeah, he didn't give us the puck. So uh, at that point, um, the stadium staff um, rushed me off to the infirmary uh, where they did a little quick check on me. And then they sent me off to walk to the hospital. So Kurt and I walked to the hospital through the deep snow. Uh, and when we got there, uh, I was given x-rays and tests and I ended up staying in the hospital for a whole week. I was hospitalized. Um, it, they watched a few uh, different things that they were concerned about. Um, at, this, at this time, I, was, I became kind of a celebrity at my school. Uh, the story got out and people heard about it and people were worried or they just thought it was entertaining. So I got lots of visits from friends at the, at the hospital. Uh, and it was, uh, yeah, it ended up being a good story for me. <laughs> Right, so next thing that we're going to do to tie this all, you'll see where I'm going with this all a little bit uh, very soon. Oops, what's this? Hold on a second, there we go. Whoa, don't look at that. All right, um, okay, so question is, how much, how well do you remember the word list and how well do you remember the story that I just told? Um, in order to uh, verify this, at this point now, I would like you, if you have a pencil, please pick up your pencil. Uh, if you just wanna write this down uh, by typing on your computer, go ahead. Um, but I'm going to first give you one minute to write down as many words as you can remember from that random list of words. Okay, I'm gonna time this. I'm gonna do one minute now. I'm gonna try and do it myself. So here we go, one minute. One minute from the, from the, from the random word list, okay. Um, I got one. Yeah, it's one. <laughs> Doing all right. I'm on. I've got two at the moment, so that's pretty good. I think I have eight. 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 What? Who's had eight? Who said maybe, eight? Maybe. <laughs> what? That's okay, it. I've got three now. Oh, four. Yeah, the average okay. is around four. Uh, I've done this session loads of times uh, live, and usually people get around eh, four. Sometimes one is nothing to be ashamed of. Because that, that does happen frequently as well. No problem. Uh, can we move on to the next bit? No, not yet. you got 10 seconds. Oh. I'm surprised Adam remembers any after getting hit with a puck. <laughs> <laughs> it, ha it hasn't helped, let me tell you. Uh, I found other strategies. Lost so many brain cells. Two, one, zero. That's it. Time up. All right. Uh, so next, we're going to see how well you remember the hockey puck story. Um, I want you to write down as many points that you remember about the story. Now, don't write, you know, a full narrative. Uh, just a single word to represent an idea is enough. So if I said something like, uh, I played baseball as a teenager, just write down baseball, that's one point. Teenager is one point. Um, yeah, so just write down as many as you have. Uh, as you can come up with. Again, uh, take a minute to do that. Okay. It's not very, and you've heard this story before, I'm sure. Um, I have once, but like, this is like my self-introduction story. I'm like, hello, my name is Adam. When I was 14, I shouldn't say, oh, I'm gonna spoil it. Uh -oh. Wait, <laughs> I can't retell it. You're so proud of this story. I think, how famous did you become? Uh, well, that's a key word, famous. Uh-oh, 
Oh. Got one. Haha. <laughs> You're spoiling it. This is not going to have a lot of face value. Well, um, face validity, rather. Sorry. It's assisted. It's assisted. Uh, 15 seconds. Hockey. Hockey. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Time up. Okay. So now, um, if you can just put um, some numbers. In, oh, wait, 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 wait. I've got to give you the answer key. Whoops. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Here we go. Where were we? Where were we? Where were we? Screen share portion of screen. Okay. So here we go. This is the random word list. So you can check how many you got correct. You might have remembered some that weren't actually on there. Okay. Uh, so everyone, put your answers in the chat box. I got four. Let's see what we get. Four as well from Wayne. Three from Lelaine. One from Mr. Room Five. One from Mike. Oliver it is. Oh yeah, oh yes, Oliver, sorry. <laughs> See, my memory isn't very good, but I, I still got four. 7.5, 7. 7. what is that? What, is that? what does that mean? <laughs> What's a point five? <laughs> Hard, but not drive. Um, I know, yeah, I remembered hanger, but not coat. Aha, uh -huh. um, no, that doesn't count. Right out, that's right out. No, get, that's out a, get out of here. We'll call it eight, we'll call yeah. it eight. Yeah. All right, All right. Uh, so you can probably guess what's gonna happen next. Here's the answer key for the story. Here are 22 points. If you remember something that's not even mentioned here because there was more information than this, uh, you can count that as a point as well. So just give yourself a quick tally there. All right, I got, I got 17. Not bad, better than, uh, better than our practice run of this presentation. <laughs> Which we don't do, obviously. This is all natural and on the spot. Seven. What did everyone get? We're still counting. Seven from Oliver. Eleven from Lelaine. Nine from Mike. That's pretty good. It's an improvement, certainly. Yeah, these scores are quite low. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like my story. Oh, my goodness. It's a rubbish story, really. <laughs> <laughs> I got one. No, you didn't. <laughs> you lie. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, if you haven't finished that yet, that's fine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just for time management sake, I'm gonna kind of move on from this. Um, so we've got another 10 there. Yeah. Okay. Right, so the question is, um, generally speaking, uh, everyone does a lot better on the story. People often remember 70% plus of the story, whereas the word list, uh, the number's much lower. So what, what are your ideas? Can you, um, what do you think? Why is it easier to remember the story than the list of words? Yeah, anything either verbally or in the chat box for that one. Why is it easier to remember the story? More interesting. Mm. That's key, yeah, for sure. It's more interesting. There's a uh, there's not a lot of interest going on when you're listening to a list of random words. Any other ideas there? Personalized, we're sort of taking interest in people. Taking an interest in people, that's very key. That's a very important point when it comes to um, stories in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unique story. Is it unique? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> my head. Not many people would get that. In Canada, it's not unique at all. I mean, everyone's getting busted up with pucks every, every day of the week. <laughs> I thought you guys were so friendly. Uh, anything there, Suzanne? I see you've got your, uh, your, your, your oh, you've muted yourself again, oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Well, I was, I was gonna say that the reason that I remembered a lot of the words from the word list is I was making up a story in my head. Ah, I see, that's one of the off. techniques. Yeah, that's right. Ah, you that's cheat. cheating. <laughs> sorry. Right, 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 right. Yeah, but that's, that's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So that's quite useful, actually. That kind of helps make our point a bit. Yeah. Um, right, so moving on a bit there. So yeah, uh, obviously it's easier to remember a story than it is uh, unconnected random bits of information. And uh, here are some of the uh, reasons for that. The information is all connected to one thread, which is what Suzanne did with uh, her memory trick. That's something that I also train myself to do, which I need to do because I've lost so many brain cells from the, the hockey incident. Um, but yeah, it's we're obviously more engaged when we're listening. We have a reason to listen. It's interesting. Uh, even more than that though, we have uh, our brain, when we are listening to a story, we have a natural uh, tendency to visualize it. 
So it's activating sort of the visual cortex in our brain. Um, we're kind of processing it in a different way like that. And also um, affect. Um, so we identify with characters, we relate to their feelings, and this creates uh, obviously more engagement and uh, allows us to remember it much more easily. Um, now to, to continue on this theme of, of stories and sort of how they affect us in the brain, um, stories are deep rooted into the core of our nature. Uh, as human beings, we're really drawn to stories. If someone's telling a story, we, we listen in. Uh, as we're reading a story, we get swept up away in our imagination. Uh, we want to tell stories about things that happened to us in our past. We want to tell stories about um, things that come from our imagination. Uh, and some interesting uh, neuroscience uh, on uh, stories or what happens in our brain when we're reading or listening to a story. Um, apparently, um, there's a universal, universal activation pattern in the brain uh, that happens when we're reading a story, according to some kind of scan, which you're looking at here. Looks all scientific. Um, but I'll, I'll try to, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'll give you some of the, um, some idea of what this pattern of activation uh, actually looks like. So the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, which is active in episodic memory recall. So episodic memory recall is when we're actually remembering uh, a story or something that happened to us in the past that has, has duration in the timeline. Uh, it's our inferior parietal lobe uh, is also activated which is, uh, plays a role in interpreting sensory da data. So feelings, smells, touch, that kind of thing. It also plays a role in understanding emotions. Um, the lateral temporal cortex uh, is also active, which is, um, is active in our visual memory and also our ability to understand uh, uh, e emotions. Uh, and finally, this is an interesting thing, is the, the long-term memories, which are stored in the hippocampal, if I'm saying that right, formation, um, the, the basically our long-term memories are going to be a collection of different short-term memories that come from these different parts of the brain. So we're storing information related to that story that is visual, emotional, um, sensory, there's a lot of different, and it's being connected to other bits of language and things like that as well. So there's a lot of connections kind of being developed when we're uh, listening to a story or reading a story. Um, what they've actually uh, found in, in this neuroscience research is that the pattern of activation in when reading a story or listening to a story is quite similar to what's happening in the brain uh, during daydreaming. Um, so during a, when we're daydreaming or when we're listening to a story, our, our minds are allowed to be free to wander and to think about different things. And during this sort of wandering of the minds, uh, we're making connections between um, our own experiences, our own feelings, other things that we know. Uh, so that this is, um, yeah, a key thing that's sort of going on in the brain during listening to a story. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about holistic approaches. So this, I think learning through stories is a really good example of a holistic approach. Uh, it's not the only one, however. Um, now to define the terms just a little bit more, um, I think it's, it's easy to understand what holism means in, uh, in contrast to its opposite, atomism. So I'll start off explaining a little bit what an atomistic uh, approach to language teaching or learning is. So um, yeah, so I think uh, a good example of an atomistic course would be a grammar syllabus. Uh, this is hence the title of the presentation. If we're looking at points one by one that have been ordered uh, into a, a syllabus and we're mastering one before moving on to the next, this would be very atomistic. We're focusing on the parts, not the whole meaning. We're not looking at the whole meaning of a text or a whole experience, but just uh, those little bits and how those work and how they mean, uh, what they mean. Um, vocabulary lists and particularly uh, lexical sets are quite typical of an atomistic um, language course. Um, a lexical set is, uh, as, as, is, as you can see here, for example, clothes, shirt, pants, shoes, skirt, uh, animals, lion, tiger, zebra, horse. Um, these are yeah, lexical sets. Now, by contrast, uh, a holistic approach is something that focuses more on the overall meaning. Um, any kind of language work would have to be sort of secondary to the overall meaning. Sometimes we want to do some language work in order to uh, help learners to understand the situation or help them to inter or achieve a certain task. Uh, but the main focus is going to be uh, 
the whole, not the parts. So some uh, really good examples of holistic approaches are uh, task-based learning, CLIL, uh, teaching content through the medium of English, uh, learning through stories, project-based learning, and extensive reading is also an excellent example where we're not looking at uh, the little parts and analyzing every little thing. Um, now, just to give get you to think about it a little bit, I wanna kind of talk about one of the most uh, popular English courses for young learners on the market. Uh, this is a syllabus from the Let's Go series. I'm sure if you've taught younger learners, you've come across this at some point in your career. Uh, now the Let's Go syllabus, do you think, uh, again, put this into the chat. Do you think that the Let's Go series is more of an atomistic um, syllabus or is it more holistic? From Wayne there, atomistic, 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 lots of atomistic. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's got certain elements that are a little bit less atomistic, but let's look a little bit at how it's arranged. So, right, we've, let's look first at this let's learn box. So we've got school items, chalk, paint, tape, scissors. These are, of course, a lexical set. Language, what does he, she have? He, she has some tape, so third person uh, present of the verb have, again, a, a point by point thing. Here we do have a song, but let's think, is this song uh, something that's more typical of a, a holistic approach? Uh, so Sue doesn't have any glue. Uh, this is essentially a chant that is going to be recycling some of the target language. So it's not a song that's arousing the, the, uh, the amygdala in the brain is not making emotional associations or stuff, anything like that when we're listening to Sue doesn't have any glue. Um, yeah, the conversation over here as well. I don't have any potato chips. I think I have some. Can I have some? Again, this is put into the context of a, of a conversation, uh, but it is, it's very, um, it's sterilized. We've taken out a lot of other language and it's really keeps quite focused on that target. Uh, finally, we do have the phonics, of course, which tends to be, uh, kind of needs to be atomistic by nature since we're looking at uh, particular uh, letter sound connections. Uh, and then here we have a story, uh, Sam's plant. So. This, again, would be something you might think, is this story-based learning? Is this a bit more holistic? Uh, but let's take a look at Sam's plant. So here we have got eight sentences um, which tell the tale of Sam and his plant. Uh, Sam has a little green plant. He has a glass pot and a blue plate. This is kind of recycling that phonics input that's come up. Uh, yeah, and if you think about it, like in box number three, when uh, the plant is big, oh no, Sam doesn't have any glue. Sam looks a bit upset. Again, we're probably not really um, sort of empathizing, thinking about his feelings and wondering what's going to happen next. So this is not really an example of a, I would call this kind of a non-story. It's, a, it's, a, it's more like practice of uh, phonics or maybe target language as well in a reading form. Useful. I'm not, I'm, I think there's plenty of good things to say about Let's Go. I'm not, it's not my intention to, uh, to criticize it, uh, but I'm just saying it's not, uh, I wouldn't consider this a holistic course. Um, all right, moving on a little bit, um, I want to look at how um, language is stored in our brain as we learn, as we learn language, as we acquire language uh, as first language learners and possibly as children in, in second language as well. So um, in our brain, for example, if we're reading the story, The Three Pigs, um, we're going to be forming connections to it, learning words like big bad wolf, runaway, brick house. Uh, if we're doing science experiments in English, we might be learning test tube, boil, experiment. Uh, these kinds of words would be connected to the experience. If we're playing with friends or doing some dramatic play, words like pirate ship, eye patch, get the treasure, these could all kind of come together in an episodic memory and be connected to each other in, in our brains. Um, language is not stored in the brain, uh, we know now. Uh, in this sort of database type format. So we don't have clothes like lexical sets as mentioned before. Um, in fact, uh, it, there's been research that shows that when learners study words in lexical sets for the first time that they encounter them, this makes it more difficult, in fact, for them to remember than easier, um, which seems a bit contradictory. And in a lot of uh, textbooks, especially younger learner textbooks on the market, will commonly see these uh, lexical sets. Uh, that being said, there is a benefit to using lexical sets um, to practice language that we've already encountered. So if you encounter language in a story, 
in a kind of natural way, the way we would have learned words in our first language. And then later on, we do some categorizing with those words. This involves some deeper cognition, and this does lead to um, uh, better acquisition of the language. Um, so I want to look at now, so that's a little bit of a description of, of holistic approaches and kind of the way language is uh, stored in our brain. Now I want to take a look at some characteristic, uh, characteristics of the way kids learn language um, and kind of think about the fit between atomistic syllabuses, holistic syllabuses, and the way children learn. Uh, so quick question again, put this, please answer this one in the chat. Who do you think can learn a language faster, a child or an adult? Into the chat box, child or adult. Got from Mike, adult. Take a guess, don't be shy. Adult, depends on what aspect of the language. Mm, adult. Interesting point. That is an interesting point. Child, but depends on conditions. Mm -hmm. mm. Child, they have more free time, <laughs> says Sarah. <laughs> uh, that is true, especially now. Child from Bonnie. We have a real a mix there of adult and child coming in in the chat box. All right, that's interesting. Well, that, that'll be good. So we'll look at, um, we'll come back to this question in a second after we look at sort of one of the key features, I think, uh, that differentiate young language learners and adults. Um, so here we have uh, the way that children learn language as they age. Now there are two, generally speaking, two uh, processes that run in tandem as we learn a language. There is uh, language acquisition and language learning. Now acquisition, the image there is of the sponge. Um, so just the ability to naturally absorb all of the information that's around us. Uh, and learning uh, is, you know, the, the ability to sit down, work through something mentally, memorize it, uh, and yeah, learn it deliberately. Um, now, looking at acquisition, as we age, of course, a baby's sole job is just to sit there and absorb everything that's going on around them. Um, they are, yeah, very much like a sponge. And this, uh, yeah, they're basically a database and they're just taking in phonological information as uh, even at, at as early as age zero uh, or even possibly earlier than that, some hypothesize. Then through the elementary school years, um, this capacity for acquisition slowly starts to uh, reduce. And then right around the onset of puberty, uh, this is when that really kind of shut, it doesn't completely shut off. Of course, their ability to acquire language never completely disappears but it uh, drops very significantly. Now learning, uh, which requires uh, capacity for abstract thought um, is something that obviously babies can't do. So at a very, very young age, there's not a lot of learning going on. A baby can't sit down and work its way through a concept or learn grammar. Uh, but as they go through elementary school, this of course runs the opposite direction of acquisition as we can see. Uh, gradually they develop more and more of an ability to, um, to um, yeah, think about abstract concepts and understand things. And then right again, around puberty, around when students are entering junior high school in Japan, uh, this ability kind of skyrockets and they can understand much more complex ideas uh, and yeah, have better control over their mental faculties. Now, uh, to go back to the question, so who can learn a language faster, an adult or a child? Uh, the answers that I have seen um, is that the, is, it is an adult, which a lot of you actually put in it, um, first when we asked the question. Uh, but of course, as, you, as it was also mentioned, uh, the, the conditions are a very important factor in this. Now, uh, an adult, of course, can learn a language uh, in a sh more condensed period of time. If they've just got a couple of hours here and there, they can use their capacity for, ab we can use our capacity for abstract thought to work through things, understand grammar, and uh, generally speaking, in a shorter amount of time, they'll be able to score um, higher on a language test and demonstrate what they've learned uh, better. Uh, however, of course, also as mentioned, and in, in the right circumstances, a child will learn um, will learn differently. So if a child, if you take a Japanese child, of course, and throw them into uh, an American school, after two years, they'll have very native-like uh, pronunciation, fluency, the vocabulary will lag a little bit, but they'll generally speaking be uh, in some ways indistinguishable from a native speaker. 
Uh, the same cannot be said for an adult who doesn't study, um, unfortunately coming to Japan and then hoping after two years you'll be fluent uh, is <laughs> unfortunately not something that happens for a lot of us. Um, right, so moving on here a little bit. So what does acquisition look like? Is this a sort of a random process? Does it mean that we can just dump whatever kind of input uh, all day long on our students and they're just going to progress uh, and they're gonna learn when, uh, at whatever rate and however they want to? Um, well, let's take a look here. I want you to think about these things here. I've got a list of six different um, morpheme, morphological features. Now, which order would you put these in? What order do you think uh, students should learn these in or what order do you think that they would learn these things in? Um, yeah, think about that for a couple of minutes or for 30 seconds. What do you think would be first in this list? Tricky question. <laughs> Am is R, maybe, says Wayne. Am is R, says Mike. Oh, great. Uh, I love past it. regular, possibly. Oh, interesting, Locked interesting. Different answers coming through. Yeah, Am is R, I'm glad you guys said that because Am is R is dead last. Uh, in the natural order of acquisition. So according to studies, uh, there is actually a predictable order, regardless of your background, your linguistic background, whether you're Japanese, Chinese, or Spanish, um, you, are, you are going to acquire language in a predictable order. Um, and there are other things in between these items, but this is how those particular items in the circle would be ranked. So M is R in the non-contracted form are actually quite late. They're after the past, the both past tenses, they're after articles, they're after third person singular S, um, but uh, the contracted form is actually quite early on in. So in some sense, uh, the people who said am is arc could be correct as well. Um, yeah, but interestingly, course books tend to not put, um, you know, past irregular until much later on, uh, sometimes closer to an A2 kind of level. I think generally it gets put into like a, an end of an A1 sort of level, uh, but this, Basically, if you've got a grammar so syllabus and you've got language ordered in a certain way, uh, if it's completely counter to uh, the order, natural order of acquisition, it's not going to be um, acquired the way you want it to. Um, I want to look at two last little concepts before we look at uh, some of the AAS press materials and how we um, make sense of all of these things in our materials. These two things are uh, the depth of processing and the last one is co connections and memory. So by depth of processing, um, the concept here is that if we're learning uh, language items through rote memorization or drilling, um, this is not going to be very deeply rooted in our brain. It's not gonna have a lot of connections and it's something that becomes easily forgotten and is more difficult for us to, to uh, retrieve. Now, when we're using language to do more cognitively challenging um, activities, so if, you're, if you have a look at Bloom's taxonomy on the side, the, the lower levels there, we've got remember and understand. These don't require a whole lot of uh, uh, cognitive effort. Uh, but when we go up to the higher order of thinking skills, analyze, evaluate, and create, uh, using language while exercising these um, higher order thinking skills does lead to uh, language knowledge that is much more retrievable and uh, a lot more stable in our, in our long-term memory. Uh, another thing here, um, connections in memory, as mentioned before, when we're listening to a story, uh, our brains are free to kind of be making connections to a lot of different things. Um, essentially, our, our memories are stored with lots of different information. We don't just have a word that's sort of floating some free in our brain and connected to nothing else. It's going to be connected to different information. So the different um, context that we learn language in. It, and in particular, if you're learning language, uh, a piece of, of vocabulary or grammar or something like that, and you're seeing it in a lot of different contexts or while thinking about a lot of different things, um, this is going to be better. The neural networks that um, connect are connected to that word are going to be better formed and, and uh, what can I say? Um, yeah, the more times that it's retrieved, that neural pathway is going to become strengthened, much like a, a path when people walk through a field of grass, grass many times. So this, yeah, this makes the connections, uh, it makes it easier to retrieve and it makes it more long-term 
in our brain. Uh, so to come back to the question, so what do young learners need? Um, so one of the things um, is input and a lot of it. So this brings us to Krashen's input hypothesis. Maybe many of you have uh, read about this before, but Krashen's uh, input hypothesis was that uh, for younger learners or for all learners, in fact, uh, to learn a language, all they really need is comprehensible input. Uh, so input that they can understand, which is of a level just above their current level. Um, it also, he also posits that uh, we need to notice a language feature before we uh, acquire it. So I like this quote he's got here. Language acquisition does not require extensive use of conscious grammatical rules and does not require tedious drill. Um, there have been studies comparing uh, extensive reading programs to traditional grammar, grammar syllabuses. And uh, in many cases, the gains uh, uh, as measured on tests um, will be similar. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it is argued that there's much more gains than using a traditional grammar syllabus. So yeah, input, a lot of it, time. Obviously, if a child is studying once a week and they're not really putting in more time and not getting on enough time to do, get all the input that they need, um, their progress is going to be rather slow. And now I'm gonna segue a little bit here into our own materials at AAS Press, uh, but we think that there's a third point here that is of absolute key importance. And that um, factor is um, engagement and motivation. So, I mean, essentially, if you think, okay, uh, all children need is a lot of input, then you can throw 10 graded readers at a, at a child and say, oh, there you go, get your, get your comprehensible input, get it in there. Um, and then you can watch as they kind of flip through it and then kind of, you know, just go through the motions, but not really, they don't really have their brain switched on. Um, I would say that does not result in language acquisition. Necessarily, kids need to be uh, engaged, have their brains switched on uh, in order to be really benefiting from the input. And this is the problem that we tried to solve uh, with our materials at AAS Press. So next here, I'm going to hand it over to Ian, and he's going to tell you a little bit about our courses. Yeah, well, thank you, Adam. I, I think Adam's gone into some you know, reasonable detail there about holistic approaches, and that issue of engagement and motivation is is very important because you can be as holistic as you want, but if your resources aren't engaging, you're not going to have much success. So keeping holistic approaches at the forefront of our minds, I'd now like to introduce you to some of the materials made by AAS Press. Uh, and I'd also like to show you how they keep learners motivated and engaged. Uh, these series also provide huge opportunities for input and make students use their brains. So they're trying to form those numerous connections, which Adam talked about. So I guess, the problem is that we encounter as educators is that it's really hard to actually make a genuinely holistic course which ticks all all the right boxes you have to like get the right language level for the materials you have to have it as age appropriate and then you have to bring it together and you have to make sure those connections are there so you know what we did for years was we sent countless hours into tweaking a syllabus around a textbook uh, and textbooks that we weren't that we felt weren't really using the correct theoretical approach or a, a theoretical approach that we enjoyed using. Um, but we felt we had to use textbooks as the basis because certainly in Japan, I think parents expect course books um, so they can see what the course is based on. Uh, it's just kind of expected. But the reality was we, we supplemented it so heavily that we barely even used the textbook in the class because it didn't engage our our learners in any meaningful way. So eventually we just pulled the trigger and we thought we'd have, uh, we have all these experiences, all this academic knowledge. Um, we feel like we're good educators. We know what works. So we should make what we feel is beneficial for our students and share that with you, obviously. So uh, the first thing which we think is important is um, the aesthetics, um, the art that's used. Um, I think they're of vital importance. Um, we often find that with lower level materials that are directed at very young children, they can appear and sound too babyish. So at the lower kind of elementary, like lower level elementary school students need something that really appeals to their sensibilities. So in our materials from the cover, um, is that one of our covers to the unit aims and the the kind of vocabulary and flashcards and then the activities that we incorporate there's a story activity and another one uh and then the stories that we integrate within our 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 communicative course um 
this is a cover of one of our mangas, our graded readers. Um, we want all of our students to be flicking through our materials incessantly and loving the art. And if they're not doing that, we're really not happy. Um, these particular images are taken from our level four series, which is aimed at kind of high A1 students. Uh, who are usually around 10 years old and hopefully you can see this kind of art appeals to them a bit more than some of the other things on the market. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to integrate within our series which we think of as important is music. Um, now I guess um, I don't know about you but when you were in elementary school I'm sure you didn't run home and put on a tape or CD of Mary Had a Little Lamb or some kind of childish thing. And I think it's worth saying that for younger, younger learners like um, of a kindergarten kind of age, um, places like Super Simple Songs are doing really good work. But for older elementary school students, I don't think there's a lot of music around that really appeals to them. So let's have a look at some of the, or have a listen to some of the music that we've created for our series. And hopefully you get the feel for what we're going for. Go for it. Feel free to dance. <laughs> I will dance. Where is it coming from? What's that sound? That's I can thing. feel it. It's coming up, up, up through the floor. Yeah. What's that sound? I can hear it. It's getting louder. I can't take it anymore. There you go. Here come the you. right there no where are you going i'm getting out of here get on the stage you're next in line show them what you can do may's life may's life it's better than school There we go. Okay. <laughs> so uh, as you can hear, um, we've tried to make Thank real you. music using kind of different genres. Uh, and yes, it has a language aim. Yes, it's graded. But we tried to make music that stands on its own merit and is engaging just because the music is good. So uh, what we showed you here in the video, which you can still see on the screen, these are the kind of song summary lyric pages in a kind of manga style. Uh, and that helps really visually support the songs uh, and keep engagement while we're, we're kind of learning them as a class. Um, so let's move on and think about generally the content. What we've tried to do is integrate graded readers within our communicative course. So there's a lot of input. Uh, and the importance of plot really matters when we think about stories. When students are at a low level, the reading materials tend to be pitched at a level which is linguistically appropriate, but usually entirely uninteresting. So uh, many stories in phonics books or low level kids readers are not really stories. They're just a series of sentences with pictures. Um, there's not necessarily any motivation, character, or anticipation of what will happen next. So we've tried to address that. Let's have a look at some of our stuff. Uh, this is the Awesome Adventure Series Level 3. This is aimed at low A1 level students between the ages of around 7 or 10 years old. And here we have uh, anything but a trivial plot, in my opinion. So in, in Manga 1, uh, the characters decide to build their own robot. Um, in the hope of avoiding chores. So they go on a quest to find all the parts. Uh, years later, because of their actions, there are robots everywhere, but the robots are up to something suspicious. So the main characters dress as robots and investigate. And it turns out that the robots are planning on taking over the world. So in book three, uh, which incidentally um, won the Language Learner Literature Award last year, um, they find some unicorns in the hope that they will save them from um, from the robots. And as a result of the battle between the unicorns and robots, the earth is severely damaged. And they get, in manga four, they go in search of a new planet, but unfortunately they don't have much luck and they have to return to the earth to clean up their planet, thus bringing the story full circle. 
and uh, they have to do not only their own chores, but the chore of cleaning up the entire earth. There you go. There's a plot. So it's not your typical story. Um, we tend and it's to, a, and it's a choose your own adventure as well. It's also that choose adventure. your own adventure elements in there as well. So the, the, the students have a choice over the direction of the story as they go. Very engaging in the classroom. So this is not your typical story. And because there are four graded manga readers, which are all about 25 pages each throughout the year, we give them out at four points throughout the year. And when we give them a new manga, um, the students are always desperate to know what happens next. They love the art. They start flicking through. Um, so uh, generally, it's not that low level learners should have these kind of plots because they're low level, uh, even though they're low level, they should have these interesting plots precisely because they are a lower level. It gives them a reason to be interested, gives them a reason to tune in. So a uh, awesome adventure manga readers are visual support for the images and make more complex ideas comprehensible. So our kids become really good with ambiguity. And it tends to be that the language learning that happens as a result of this is more incidental uh, because of the level of engagement, which is exactly what we want if we're going for a holistic course. Um, so I think it's useful to look at the sequence of um, how we structure our communication course around the awesome adventure series. Um, Sorry, I don't know. I just have to chime in to tell you it's 5.30. Yeah. It's the official time, but um, I would certainly like to hear more. And um, I don't <laughs> think there's a book we just um, can continue. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We've got probably four ish minutes left, I guess, Ian. Yeah, not, not too much yeah. more. I think it's a couple of little videos to show as well. But if people want to stay, then uh, we're happy to have them here. Uh, oh, thank great. you very much. Thanks. Um, so essentially, like, I don't know about the people in here, but I don't, I don't know how you feel about using routines with your younger learners. I mean, there are a lot of benefits to using routines in the classroom, but depending on the age, I think we need to think about whether the routine is robbing the learners of engagement. Uh, they may not need to think or they may not get excited because they know everything that's going to come. Uh, so studies show that novelty activates the brain. And uh, as the activity becomes more familiar, this effect diminishes. So for the Awesome Adventure series, we use a spiral syllabus that has four three-month cycles. Um, so let's have a look at that a little. So this is textbook one, which covers the first three units. Uh, so in unit one, we introduce some vocabulary. Um, and look at the aims. And this vocabulary ties into a song. This particular song is called Just Like in the Videos. And it's a song about how all the main characters here want to become YouTube famous. Uh, and then from learning this song, it leads into a communicative activity. Uh, this is called I Want to Be Famous. So it's having the students really kind of connect to the experiences and feelings of the characters in the song. Um, then this leads into another unit so unit two introduces some more vocabulary. And this vocabulary is, is, is kind of blocking vocabulary for the manga, which we then give to the students. Uh, and that's the focus of this month. So uh, let's have a look inside the manga, uh, some pages there. The story of this particular manga, which links to the song, same characters, is that the characters are trying to break out of their house because their parents have got them on strict lockdown. Uh, and they want to get to the park to... Um, get to their treehouse and perform a song and practice their song so they can become YouTube famous. Uh, and from this, we have another speaking activity. Uh, this is called Get to the Treehouse. It's a problem solving activity where our students have to communicate together to work out the best strategy to get to the treehouse. And then from that, unit three, uh, some more vocabulary is introduced, which is purely for speaking activities. Uh, and then that leads into some other activities like this one, which is a survey of um, students kind of personality and their skills. And they, they plot it on a personality gap uh, graph, very communicative. All this is kind of linking and building and recycling a la the language as we go along. So we're making sure they're giving them a, we're giving them a lot of exposure to the kind of language they need. Um, and then, so just a reminder, that one goes vocabulary song speaking, vocabulary story speaking, vocabulary speaking speaking. And the next slide. So essentially, if we repeat this for a further three textbooks with three mangas and three songs and a million different communicative activities, which all link together, we get some pretty good results. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, um, I, I guess the, the the purpose of this sequence is it achieves, sorry, sorry, let's go back a bit. <laughs> uh, the purpose of this sequence is uh, novelty is maintained, 
it caters to different learner styles, stages ample input before output, it gradually builds up considerable language resources, enabling for more complex stories and more complex tasks as we go along, because cognition is important. And in terms of connectionism, by encountering the language in various contexts and doing meaningful tasks, the neural network needed for the retrieval of the word or phrase is strengthened, which leads to faster acquisition. Now, if we go to the next one, um, I guess the question is, it is all well and good for textbook designers to come along and be like, oh, we've taken into account all the theory. We're so clever. But in reality, it doesn't always turn out like that when you try to do it in the classroom. So we want to try and show you what it actually looks like in the classroom. So have a look at this video. This is Adam's class. Uh, he got permission to film them and share it. So uh, see what you think of this. We can save, we can save the world. He said, what did he say? Dangerous. It's very dangerous, so don't. Don't. Yep. Don't open. 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 Start together. This is a choose your own adventure element, so the students are choosing together where they want to go next in the story. Go to the evil. Let's go to the evil. What is this? Destroy everything. Yes. I uh, no. Mm, yeah. A <laughs> robot uh, uh, making a robot uh, ev every everywhere. Everywhere. Do you remember? No city. No city. I I know city. I don't. I know city. No building. Go to the big tree. Big tree. Very nice to meet you. Nice. Oh shoot, I've done it again. Ah, I always do this. Don't touch anything. Skip over here. Okay. So um, I think, you know, hopefully you can see there's a lot of engagement there. Um, and I think, I don't know, Adam, did, should we skip the recycling bit? Um, I think it's pretty important. It's, you can probably do it pretty quick. Okay. We're almost so, done. you know, uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of engagement there and uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, we've tried to take into account recycling. Um, essentially, um, have a look at this video as well. Let's, let's skip the video. Let's just take okay. a look. Yeah. So essentially this is like, the, the final manga, manga number four, which would be unit 11. And we've recycled a lot of language here. Yeah, this is the, the manga four. So here we've got like, let's go, that's from unit two. We've got, they go down, that's from unit four originally. The door opens, that's from unit five originally. Stand in line, that's from unit four originally. Don't know, that's from unit two originally. And make a pizza, that's from unit three. You saw the make a pizza task in that video just there. So we're always making sure that we're recycling all of our language, which occurs um, in, in as many contexts as possible. Um, and I think- Should we uh, zip through Awesome Phonics as well? Very quickly. <laughs> uh, we've also seconds. got, yeah, this is also a holistic course, Awesome Phonics Adventures, um, very quickly. Um, we've got self-assessment page. Okay. Uh, unit one. We've got vocabulary, which links into a story or a song. We introduce the new letters. 
uh, in. And then we do some blending with those new letters, reading of the individual words, then notice for noticing sight words or, or little grammar elements, um, which is kind of incidental, and then reading sentences, um, and then writing sentences. Uh, the key thing about this is, um, it is it is holistic. We're trying to focus on meaning. Um, it's very easy to kind of just teach decoding in phonics, but we want to focus on stories and songs so that the students are actually engaged with the materials. Um, yeah, and that's that's yeah. one. Please check that one out at our website. So I guess the final thing to do is, is very briefly talk about why AAS Press Materials, why you should use AAS Press Materials in your institution. So I think for any institution, student engagement should be key. Uh, and this is achieved through the art, the music, the stories and meaningful communication. Um, it's also theoretically sound and it's, uh, it's holistic as we've talked about. Um, and something we found at our school is that from surveys, student, parent and teacher satisfaction have all massively increased as a result of using these materials. There's a kind of spillover effect because we're asking teachers to deliver this um, syllabus in a way which focuses on all of these core skills. They become better teachers, especially for teaching kids. So that's fantastic. And then I think specifically for businesses, um, st our staff here find this incredibly easy to sell to parents because it speaks for itself. The kids are their eyes light up when they see these products, um, and they you know they believe in them as well. And I think uh, this one's kind of interesting: the upsell opportunities, which I think Adam might want to talk about a little. Yeah, well, I think I mean what's good for your students is also good for your school. Um, if you think if your students are coming for just one hour of English classes a week, it's probably not enough for them to make the kind of progress that you want them to make. Uh, and of course, it's good for you as well if they're taking additional courses. And I think instead of again throwing away your grammar syllabus as we've uh, titled the presentation, you don't need to do that. I think keeping that but offering additional courses that of a very different variety that complement that really well. Um, you can offer for your students to take more classes a week and to improve more. And of course, that works for you as well. Uh, we find a lot of the students at our school, since we've been var varying our courses with the phonics, grammar, CLIL, and the AAS, uh, Awesome Adventure Series courses, uh, typically uh, students are taking more than one lesson. Uh, and as a general result, our students are uh, progressing a lot more and they're communicating a lot more. And that's about it. I'm sorry, we're about 12 minutes over time. Well, I, I just want to do with a couple of these questions that are on here a second. There's All right. that, well, just one question here. This one's interesting. Can a textbook be used with a private student? And is it possible to jump in from book three? Yes, it is possible to use with a private student. Absolutely. The tasks are designed so that they can be done with two people. Uh, so the teacher and a private student. Is it possible to jump in from book three? Yes. What I would do in that circum in that situation is I would probably give the student the mangas and give them the CD of the music and then give them the textbook from where they are. So, you know, you can enjoy the story as a, as a collective whole, um, but they do stand alone to an extent anyway. I uh, to answer that as well, I mean, we yeah. do have at the end of the year, we've got some students joining to start next year, and we are starting some students in unit 11 of, of, <laughs> yeah. of an awesome adventure series course, and generally we'll let them finish and start again. It's not ideal, um, but it, it, do, it does work fine. It's not really a big issue. No, I, I don't think it's a big issue. I mean, kids kind of roll with it as long as the tasks, like I had a kid who came into a class first time this week, and it was a, a story unit. And they were, it's the last story of a, a set of four, but they were still enjoying it uh, a lot anyway, because if you make engaging stories, engaging stories are engaging. Kids yeah, are really good with ambiguity. Them again. Yeah. yeah, I think doing the course, we've had some learners doing the course for a second time. Uh, and we worried at first, like, oh, if they already know the story, maybe they won't be into it. But much like in your favorite movies, um, the, the more times you go through it, the more things you notice, the more you learn from it. Uh, so we found that to be successful as well. I think Bonnie had a question about the price there. Yeah. Well, actually, we're probably worth looking at the final slide of the presentation. Is it? Uh, I think w with respect to the price, you can definitely, this, this event is sponsored by EBJ, uh, Englishbooks.jp. Uh, and I know that they've got some big, I think they were offering a 40% off deal or something like that now as well. So certainly check out their site um, and you'll be able to find some good deals, I think. Did you want me to screen share something there, Ian? Uh, just the final slide with our website, oh, yeah. so the one after that one. Yeah. So do you want to put your link, any links in the chat that people can? Oh, uh, that's a smart yeah, idea. Yeah, sure. Uh, our, our regular website for our AS Press materials is aspress.com. 
Um, obviously, you can. Uh, we've, we've still a, a shop up on there, but it's coming down soon because we're with EBJ from uh, shortly. So our materials will be available on there. Uh, I guess the thing is with this, like you can buy the individual mangas for below a thousand yen, I think, and the textbooks are all below a thousand yen. Um, but we we kind of package it as one course, um, which for, for the whole year, which uh, is pretty good. And then uh, I guess like we have. Oh, by the way, we mentioned an app earlier, didn't we? Uh, our app we're working on, the Gamerize Dictionary, um, which you can check out at this website if you're interested in helping us out with some beta tests. Um, so plenty of stuff to check out. Uh, you're welcome, Bonnie. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah, there I think was one that's... question I had there. Are yeah. there e ebook versions? Um, oh, ebook versions, yeah. Online and stuff. Is that um, are they available? I'm not sure. We have ebooks made. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure how we're uh, dealing with those yet. I think that's that's a discussion that we're having with EBJ at the moment as well. Yeah, they're made. They are made, but I'm not sure how we're we're granting access to those at the moment. So right, we'll, yeah, we'll, that's, that's that's for us to think through. You don't want them. <laughs> there, there is also <laughs> audio books. Oh, sorry about that. Apologize, Oliver. Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah, right. I understand. Yeah. Just the digital rights for ebooks. It's a tricky thing you want right. to nail down here. Um, yeah, there's, there's audio books that go with all of the comics as well, which are, are all professionally voice acted and all that as well. So um, please, those are quite quite fun for the kids as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, all of them, all of the mangas have QR codes in which um, link to the audio for the books as well. So it's all it's all voice acted professionally. Some, some mostly professional. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Right. Looks extremely high quality. All the art and all the music. Um, yeah, really beautiful. Material. Thank you very much. Probably Thanks a lot. For my for my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the the mangas, uh, the mangas, the graded comic readers, whatever we want to refer to them as, they can be um, they can be purchased separately. They don't have to be part of the communication course. They stand alone. They're very engaging. Like kids seem to be really into them. So. Uh, yeah, you can always just buy them as a set of four like that as well. Um, oh, here we go. Some more questions. You're welcome, Bonnie. Uh, Liz, Liza, Liza and Gareth. Uh, aside from clear task-based task -based language teaching activities, what are other examples of holistic-based teaching? Do you have teaching materials that promote such kinds of teaching? Hmm. Well, I, I think the thing about that one is, um, oh, this is aside from clear and task-based learning. Hmm. I think uh, we mentioned, well, the only one that you're missing there, which I've, I mentioned earlier as well, is extensive reading, which I think is a really um, essentially very holistic. I'm sure there are other examples. I'm kind of drawing a blank now, but essentially anything that is focusing on, on meaning uh, communication and that the language work is not going to be the, the driving principle in it. Um, yeah. Hmm. Content-based learning, which is very similar to CLIL. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we, we are practitioners of CLIL at our school and unfortunately we haven't had the opportunity to make any materials which are CLIL related at the moment. We'd love to do that in the future um put together like a, a holistic kind of clear based curriculum because we we love doing stuff like that here um it's just we haven't we need to get it in the pipeline at some point that'd be lovely <laughs> yeah. just to remind us one more time what's um what age range do you think these are suitable for for elementary school is that Definitely elementary school. I think there, what we perceive as being the gap uh, in the industry is for materials that are really engaging for particularly older elementary school students. Uh -huh. um, so the, these are, are, we've got students for anywhere from grade one and grade uh, six using them. I think one of the videos you saw, there was a young boy who was really excited during his story. He's in grade one uh, and he absolutely loves uh, the material. He's one of the, our biggest fans. Uh, so definitely appropriate for that whole range. The second, the course that, that, that looks at the YouTube, the, the students that want to become, or the kids that want to become YouTube stars, that kind of the themes are a little bit more older elementary school for that. Um, it, the, the theme kind of leads to, it talks a little bit about skills, development, um, growth mindset, and not trying to be someone else. So definitely a little bit more appropriate for older kids. 
Yeah, um, I, I think with our phonics course, that one is kind of aimed from like K3 um, to maybe like grade one or grade two. But even older kids really enjoy it. Could go, but, could go older for sure. Yeah. yeah, you could certainly go older if they're not very good with their phonics and their reading skills. Um, we're developing this year, level, you, what we've shown in, in this particular presentation is level three and level four of our communication course series. Uh, this year, we're developing the level two series, which should be, I guess we could say that's kind of aimed at grade one and up, probably. And that's kind of like pre a kind of pre A1 level. So mm -hmm. with not, not that much English at that point. Would you say most of the speaking tasks, like in the video, I saw some very nice looking uh, information gap tasks. Is that kind of the mm -hmm. format for a lot of the speaking tasks? Would I wouldn't say uh, information gap is a format. There's, there's a lot of problem solving kind of games. Uh, um, problem solving is a big type. There is one of the things you saw was an in information gap, but it was a, a map from one of the, um, the from basically the landscape in the story, and the students are you know giving directions to go around it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's kind of information gappy. Um, but yeah, uh, I'd say we certainly there's, use there, there are, actually there are some creative tasks as well. In, like we use there's one that's built. They have to build a city at the end of the entire uh, the level three series. They're they're supposed to build a green city of the future. So they're given cutouts. Uh, there's extensive cutouts of different buildings and they've got a map and they need to talk together about what buildings they want, and where they want to put them, what are close, what's more important than, than what else. So there's, there's a lot of those kind of creative tasks as well. We generally try to stage the tasks um, to kind of gradually increase the linguistic and cognitive demands, a la kind of um, following a bit of the CLIL methodology. Okay, I think we might have to wrap it up there. Are there any All right. final questions? from uh, our listeners. Thank you very much, everyone, for staying for this long. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. We appreciate that very much. Unmute to give some applause to our Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much, Adam Thanks, and Ian. Suzanne. Thanks for coming for a second Thank session you. there as well. Thanks. <laughs>